Chicago's L trains. To all intents and purposes, they are, to many, the rolling, creaking symbols of the city. Every day, the CTA's elevated trains and subways carry some 700,000 riders. Most years, those riders travel nearly 60 million miles without a mishap. This is the story of one of the CTA's worst mishaps ever, and it happened right up there. And that is the first shot that we can see of the car hanging precariously at best at 529 this afternoon. A Ravenswood train and a Lake Dan Ryan train collided. Anyone who was in Chicago that night in 1977 will always remember where they were when it happened. It was the night the L fell. One ran into another, two cars fell to the pavement, over 100 people injured. Our story this time comes from NBC library tape number 48, February 4th of 1977. This is the first visual look at the ambulances, obviously taking some of the injured away. That's at the corner, I think, of Lake and Wabash. We said once more, a four-car Ravenswood line train was rounding a turn and heading west at State and Lake Street when that accident occurred. These are the first pictures that we have of what happened. Nothing's really changed here at the corner of Lake and Wabash. That's the exact same L structure where two cars were left dangling and two crashed to the street back in 1977. When it happened, those cars were packed at the height of the evening rush. This is the curve, and it would have been the outer track here, turning from north on Wabash to west in Lake. Bruce Moffat not only spent decades working for the CTA, he literally wrote the book on the agency's history. I've always been a rail enthusiast and a rail historian on local transit. And in an incredibly strange twist of fate, he was here at Lake and Wabash right after the train crashed to the street. And I got off at Staten Lake, walked around the corner here onto Lake, and there it was. So the first car ends up right here? Yes. You could walk across Lake Street and actually you know, just take in that the first car was totally on its side. If you walked far enough over, you could tell that there was another car leaned up against the structure. And now we have a report, I think, from Pat O'Brien, who is on the scene. Pat, yes, we just Mark. got our first look at it. What's it like now? Are you looking at it now? We just uh, finished looking at okay. it. Okay. Uh, well, as you, you, you probably saw, it is chaos down here. We do have reports that at least 100 have been injured. There are buildings in the area that are taking injured as well. And so that 100 may be low because there are many people in the office buildings here that were just taken into hallways and given immediate first aid. Uh, they are asking any doctors who are in the area if they could come to this area. Reporter Pat O'Brien was right about those early numbers being low. 11 people died in the accident and over 170 were injured. Look at these pictures taken by the Sun-Times that night, which you can see on the Chicago History Museum website. Car number one, laying in the street. Number two, dangling from the tracks. Number three, in the curb lane along Wabash. And number four, also hanging precariously from the L structure above. Of course, we would ask that you stay away from this area. Needless to say, the police need all the help they can get, and they don't need crowd control as one of their problems. But again, we'll stay with it until we have more information, and I think Maury may have some at this point.
Yeah, it looks like uh, from the looks of that car that it was one of the newer cars. And I think now we have a report from Martha Teichner, who is at uh, one of the hospitals, possibly Henroten. Martha? Yes, Maury, I am at Henroten. I am standing uh, at a phone that is about three feet from three bodies that have been brought in. Moments ago, a priest came in and made the sign of the cross on the foreheads of each of them. Okay, this is Henry Prater, who was uh, an eyewitness to this accident. Sir, can you tell us from the beginning what you saw? Well, I was standing uh, facing Wabash, and I heard this crash, something like an explosion. And then I saw the trains, the, the uh, trains was start tumbling to the street with a very slow motion kind of thing. It looked almost like they had a movie. That's what it really looked like. But how could something like this even happen? A Ravenswood train was stopped just past this curve. The Lake Dan Ryan train came up behind it and hit it. And that's the train that fell to the street. The motorman started the train. And even though he had been following that Ravenswood train for the last six blocks on Wabash, he ran into it. When the collision occurred, from what can be gleaned from the NTSB reports, the motorman still had his hands on the controls and the train was still in power. So the front cars, although derailed, were not moving of their own accord. The rear cars were still getting the command to move forward and they literally pushed the train off the structure. Okay, uh, we are here with Mayor Michael Bolandic who arrived on the scene uh, well, I would say about a half an hour ago. What are your major problems here now, well, besides getting the injured out, sir? Do you have crowd, crowd problems? The principal problem now is to be able to remove the people that are still in the uh, wreckage without causing any other problem because some of these cars are precariously tilted. Now then, as far as the dead, there are six dead on arrival at nearby hospitals, and there are seven apparently still trapped in the cars. Dick K. Dick, Dick has just been down there. Dick, we're talking about the uh, car with the coupling hanging. What have you got on that? Pat, apparently what it is, there are three cars still coupled together. One that you can see the, uh, at the 45-degree uh, angle. The other one is lying flat. Now, some of the people who were injured or killed, as a matter of fact, uh, might have been pedestrians and that middle car probably fell down on top of them. What they're going to try to do now is put airbags under it and raise it. Edna Johnson has ridden the Lake Street L for eight years. What actually happened today? I don't know. I, I know I just flew out of the seat over against the door and the lights all went out and everybody started screaming. Did you see anybody hurt or were you hurt? Well, I heard a lot of people screaming. I'm all bruised, I know. Which old car were you on? The second. Now there is your picture of a car hanging over the tracks. And it has been an afternoon of utmost tragedy in Chicago's loop. As a crowded, elevated train, one ran into another, two cars fell to the pavement, over 100 people injured. What better view of all this than a passenger in the first car on the Lake Dan Ryan, the man who sat in the very first seat, 23-year-old John Williams, on his way home from work. In the middle of the turn, you know, uh, I heard this screeching noise and I looked up, train sort of tilted, you know, sort of rocked a little bit and then, uh, you know, you could hear people, you know, stumbling about and so forth and finally it fell. Friday night would become Saturday morning, and the weekend would bring troubling questions about what happened as investigators started going through the wreckage piece by piece. The damaged cars had been brought to the Skokie shop Saturday, where they'd been propped up on emergency trucks and kept under incredibly heavy security. Notwithstanding considerable denting, the result of the 17-foot plunge, the cars appeared remarkably intact, a possible indication of their essentially sound structure. And now, for some days, the NTSB will be going over them with a fine-tooth comb. We'll be, uh, in looking at the car, we'll be checking the signal system that the motorman had available to him. We will be testing the brakes at a later time. That will take more time. We'll be looking at the car itself, the crash impacts, uh, where the impact was. 
Investigators would later put trains on the tracks exactly where they were that day, riding through the scene to simulate the crash. Here's the result of that investigation issued 11 months later. Officially, the board ruled that the motorman failed to exercise due care in meeting his responsibilities. Investigators said he should have been able to see the stop train ahead and should have been able to stop, and that his train appeared to still be under power at the point of impact and maybe even after. The motorman had four joints of marijuana in a shoulder bag, but blood tests performed after the accident were inconclusive. Was he just not paying attention, you know, uh, off, uh, you know, daydreaming? Uh, we'll never know. There has always been an almost romantic allure to the L. Its sound and the way it seems to fly through the air. That may be why it was such an unforgettable sight here at Lake and Wabash the night the L fell here in Chicago.